Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Maria, for inviting me. Thanks for having me. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Bohacek. Um, I'm a former uh, policy fellow here at the School of Transnational Governance at the EUI. And um, uh, my specialty is in space policy and mainly in space resource policy. Um, so I will be taking the discussion about space resources a bit higher um, to the space. And um, surprisingly, there's a lot of um, parallels with the way we treat space resources down on Earth. And I think it's very interesting because I think it can, um, uh, looking at space resources can sort of offer us some, um, some perspectives and maybe some ideas um, what we can do with space resources down on Earth. Um, uh, because if we think space uh, if we think resources are scarce down on Earth, um, it's much more complicated up in um, in the space. Um, so I will start with um, um, uh, with several minutes trying to introduce to you the topic of space resources and space mining, just to give a, some sort of a good introduction and description about the topic, which um, is probably um, uh, relatively new and. To please feel free to drop in any questions um, if something's unclear, if I can make something, um, uh, if I can explain something better. Um, and um, um, after that introduction about the space resources, I will dive into um, um, uh, what I have worked on for uh, several years now um, um, as part of this government project for, um, the, um, for um, crafting a space resources policy for the Czech government. Um, um, this was a project funded by the Ministry of Transportation, which is the ministry that handles um, space resource, uh, space activities in the Czech Republic. And we were tasked with um, a mapping, not only our technical, um, industrial and research uh, capabilities in space resources um, area, but mainly to map out the legal aspects, the policy aspects, and um, uh, the way um, this can be treated. And um, um, our solution kind of came um, of by looking at the way um, uh, space resources are managed down on Earth, um, and mainly using the concept of social license to operate, and I'll I will get there um, at the end. Um, uh, so these are just some of the publications um, uh, we have produced um, over the uh, last two years um, uh, on using social license to operate. Um, and um, uh, there's one more paper coming up um, in um, in hopefully in few few weeks. Um, on using the space uh, so, on a social license to operate concept um, to sort of uh, solve some of the issues, uh, legal and governmental issues that um, uh, surround space resource utilization. So space mining, what is space mining? This is what space mining is not. Um, it does not look like that. It's, it will likely not look like that. This is one of the popular pictures that uh, is shown um, a lot of times. Um, um, and another um, uh, misunderstanding about space mining and space resources is that we um, want to do that um, as humanity to bring resources down to earth. Um, that is definitely not the main um, uh, line of thinking um, in that area because um, um, planet earth is plentiful of all the things that we need. It's, it's perfect. It's incredibly perfect for us to live in. And um, we have everything we need here, essentially. Um, uh, the concept of space resource utilization, called also SRU, is, um, uh, is many times rightly called in-situ resource utilization. And the main idea is that we do not want to bring everything that we will need on in space up there because it's extremely uh, costly and extremely expensive. When you think of a rocket, 90% of the weight of the rocket is just fuel because we live on planet Earth, which is very dense, has a big gravity, has, is, is located in a so-called gravitational well. So getting off Earth is what consumes 90% of the rocket. So if you wanna do anything, if you wanna stay sustainably in space, we need to uh, make things there and learn how to make and use things there and be there sustainably, not bring everything with us. So that's the main logic about space resource utilization. Um, sounds pretty simple, but um, it gets more complicated. Um, one of the main interesting uh, things about space resource utilization or, or uh, prod or materials or resources is uh, water. A um, few years ago, there's been a lot of media attention about space resource utilization because of the so-called um, gold um, and platinum rich asteroids. Um, uh, 
it was a big media hype. Um, some companies started and, and very quickly went bankrupt, but that, that you know, mining gold and platinum rich asteroids is not what drives this, um, this area. Um, what drives it is mainly water. Um, um, and, may, and water, not for the reasons to use it as um, um, uh, for life support systems, for drinking, but to use it for propellant. You take water, you, with electrolysis, you um, uh, um, uh, separate it into oxygen and hydrogen, and those are the two main components of propellant. Um, if you don't use some uh, hydrogen oxygen um, rockets, um, engines, you likely use um, um, uh, oxygen um, hydrazine um, or methane uh, rocket engines, which is what SpaceX uses. Um, but for that main uh, part of the propellant is oxygen. You need oxygen to oxidize um, um, the combustion and um, to have the thrust. And um, so, so oxygen is the main thing um, in, that we're looking for. Um, we're quite lucky that on the moon, there are all these areas on the, um, uh, on the polar areas. This is the South Pole, which, is, which you can see on the left side. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of frozen ice in, um, in craters there, um, left from different asteroid impacts. Um, and um, uh, the, the, the picture on the right, that's the concept of how we can most effectively use it um, and mine it. Um, uh, the ice there is located, it's, it's frozen within the regolith. Regolith, that's, that's the word for, um, for um, any type of a space um, um, uh, soil, essentially. Um, and um, uh, one of the most uh, frequently used concept is um, to uh, uh, direct sunlight from um, uh, from above, from, from the edges of the craters, inside of the shaded craters, um, heat up some sort of a, uh, through some atmo atmospheric heating, the area, make sure that the water evaporates and then we then to collect it on the so-called cold finger. It just simply condensates there and then you can, you know, um, harvest it and, 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 and um, separate it into oxygen and, and um, hydrogen. Um, there are some other um, uh, methods that are being researched uh, research that um, we should see within one to three years be tested on the moon. Um, and, um, uh, but but uh, water on uh, polar regions of the moon is the main um, uh, excited com commodity in, in space. Um, another thing, as I said, is the oxygen. There's, not, there's oxygen not only um, in um, connection with, um, with hydrogen in form of water, but also um, everywhere else on the, on the moon. Um, but it's in form of oxides, oxides which are connected with some sort of a metal. Um, and um, another you know, area that is being researched, um, I'm, I'm myself part of some of these research projects, is to learn how we can separate oxygen from these metals, uh, from these um, oxide metals, essentially. So here on the right um, uh, side, you can see actually one of the um, uh, test results of this oxygen extraction technique, where they took a regular simulant and they extracted the oxygen and what was left, what they were left with was just pure metal. And, you know, that pure metal can be again used for so many, you know, things for manufacturing, for creating simple structures. Um, one of the projects that I'm involved in is focused on this process of making, making sure that we can use this sort of residual waste, residual uh, uh, metal waste to manufacture antennas, some structure parts, um, and um, anything that we actually could need on the moon. Um, so oxygen um, is still uh, the main interesting thing, as I said, because of the propellant. Um, same goes for activities on the, on the Mars, as, I, um, <clears throat> as you can see the picture above, that's the Perseverance rover. It has a very interesting uh, box that, uh, called MOXIE that has tested um, the technique to create oxygen from the Martian atmosphere, which is mainly um, carbon dioxide. Um, so, so these things, um, I think, are the logic um, uh, why you know we can look at space resources and think about sustainability because if we learn how to make something out of essentially nothing that's out there in space on the moon and mars it will be very um useful for us to use down on earth um that's the whole logic about um uh, you know um uh, making oxygen out of carbon dioxide down on earth as well um uh, if we think of um, water recycling uh, we don't need water for uh, living on the moon or Mars because 
100% water recycling is already being um, uh, performed at the um, International Space Station. Um, it's it's much more valuable to be used. Uh, water is much more valuable to be used as a propellant. Um, all these recycling uh, technologies were developed for space station and for space activities. We use them now, now down on Earth. Same goes for effectivity of, um, of solar panels. So that's the, that's, those are the main ideas why space resources can um, technologically help us to find solutions down on Earth. Um, this is just one of the big studies that was done by, um, uh, by PwC. Um, they estimate the value of the space resources market um, to save up to 254 billion euros. Um, that's up till until the year 245. Um, those are, you know, um, uh, big numbers, obviously, um, we can <laughs> talk about how um, accurate they are and how well we can uh, predict uh, costs and, and values um, uh, for 25 years ahead. Uh, but the economic reasons are, are, are there and they're, they're, um, they're pretty big. Um, <clears throat> so this is just the overview. It, it looks, I think, um, uh, as, as I just briefly summarized, it's very appealing, very interesting, um, but it's we have um, a lot of barriers that are holding us back before we realize, you know, this this um, this idea of using resources in space and 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 moving forward. Um, and um, there are pretty much three big gaps that we're facing. First of them is still relatively big knowledge gap. Second one is some um, uh, legal gap, and third one is governance gap. <clears throat> um, legal gap. Well, first space resources are uh, beyond our you know, resources beyond national jurisdiction. So that itself um, uh, carries a lot of issues and challenges. Um, we have um, space law, international space law that is relatively well established, um, but it does not directly say anything about space resources. So we're limited in that sense. Uh, we don't know clear, clear, we don't have clear answers on who can own things in space, who can mine in, sp in space, whether uh, the first come first served principle would apply. Um, and I'll get to that later. Regarding knowledge gap, we still need to figure out a lot of techniques, a lot of prospecting, a lot of technologies, and just a lot more knowledge to even talk about what is right to use and how we should use these resources in space. And, um, and lastly, the governance gap. Um, obviously, the question who decides uh, who will mine wealth is, uh, is problematic. Um, any global governance question is problematic, especially nowadays. Um, we do have the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space that is dedicated to discuss these uh, topics. Um, but uh, unsurprisingly, they have not came to any um, consensus um, or any, um, let's say, productive um, uh, uh, solutions. So, um, and I will get to details on that as well. Um, the first first issue is the legal gap, and um, this is a very complicated and 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 deep discussion that has been um, happening in the area of space law. Um, and I'll try to summarize the main issues. Well, the first thing is that um, the main international space law is the, the whole body of international space law is pretty much um, summarized by five treaties that we have. We have only five international space law treaties that are widely accepted. They all were created in the 60s and the 70s. And since then, we have not created any space uh, activity related um, um, international treaty. One of the reasons was that during the 60s and 70s, it was mainly the Soviets and, um, and, um, and the Americans um, uh, that were relatively doing anything meaningful in space. Um, and um, they created the Outer Space Treaty um, uh, with, um, with very strong cosmopolitan principles principle that space belongs to all humankind, that space um, uh, need, has to be used for the benefit and interest of all countries and, um, and, and, and just for humanity, um, which sounds very, um, very noble. But the main reason, obviously, was geopolitics. They wanted to make sure that the other side doesn't win space, doesn't own moon, and, and is not ruling in that domain. Um, uh, but we have pretty much this outer space tree that as the main you know, international um, legal framework um, uh, that we can look to. There is the so-called Moon Agreement, which was um, uh, uh, developed in the 80s and in the 90s. Um, however, only um, uh, 
about, um, I think it's about uh, 13 countries that um, either signed it or, um, or ratified it. So it is not considered as being part of this um, uh, robust um, space uh, legal framework. Um, the next, next issue we have here is obviously that um, uh, space resources are beyond national jurisdiction. And the question, how do we govern and what, let's say, legal regime or legal status we assign to um, resources beyond national jurisdiction. And here we can look at um, three different um, legal um, concepts. One is res communis, one is res nullus, and um, the last one is common heritage of mankind. Um, I'll, st I'll start with the last one. Common heritage of mankind, that's the concept that is being used for the, um, uh, for the, the legal concept that is being used, for example, for um, governing um, um, uh, deep seas and, 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 um, and um, uh, seabed um, regions and the resources there. Um, and um, uh, it has been uh, accepted um, after the Outer Space Treaty. Outer Space Treaty, however, does not include the specific legal status, common heritage of mankind. Um, it is included in the Moon Agreement, but we can consider Moon Agreement as being not accepted by a sufficient amount of uh, nations. So we cannot consider it as the common heritage of mankind. Um, res communis or res nullus are the other two concepts um, uh, that can be applicable here um, uh, that deal with, um, um, uh, with, with, the, with the resources beyond national jurisdiction. Um, um, uh, for example, um, uh, areas, um, 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 uh, let's say resources that are um, exhaustible or resources that are not exhaustible. Um, so, so, so these are these are another questions that we uh, don't have answers to. And um, within this, you know, legal uh, vacuum, um, uh, with international space law working on the principle that it has to be enacted by national legislations to take effect. Um, uh, there are four countries that have adopted their own space resources uh, legislature. It's United States, Luxembourg, um, United Arab um, Emirates, and Japan, um, which has been in some ways very controversial um, uh, for the case of the United States. Um, um, they have done so um, in a way that their law says um, any extraction of resources must comply with international space law, but they do not define what that what does that mean? What does it mean to comply with the outer space treaty uh, um, articles, um, how to fulfill them, and doesn't really give answers to um, whether if it's even possible. Um, um, Luxembourg um, uh, did a similar law, um, uh, they did uh, a much broader, it did it in a much broader sense, um, because um, um, they gave rights to any entity that is based in Luxembourg to be able to um, uh, extract resources. United States, they limit to, limit it to U.S. citizens. And just to give you more um, information about international space law, the main principle that is there of the Outer Space Treaty is that um, it did not precede um, existence of private space actors. So any, li any legal liability for any activity in space is always bared by a nation state that has authorized that space operation. Um, so um, uh, national space mining legislations, they give authorization and uh, to, 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 for resources to be mined and they bear uh, within that logic, the responsibility for any activity that the private actor does. Um, <clears throat> and um, the two main issues that are, that exist within the outer space treaty that we can um, uh, or two main articles that we can consider that speak in some indirect way to the use of uh, space resources in the Outer Space Treaty are the Article 1 and Article 2. The Article 1 is, um, um, is or the so-called Common Benefit Clause, describes how the space should be used for the benefit um, uh, of an interest in all countries. What does that mean? How how do we need to fulfill it? Whether if that means only sharing some basic scientific data as it has been done by many space actors or whether it means if we mine resources, we have to share the part of it or we have to share the benefit that we extract from them. It, we, we do not know how exactly to fulfill this um, article. Um, uh, the practice so far has been to source in some way ignore it. Uh, many legal scholars say it's only 
has some sort of a symbolic uh, value that it doesn't mean that we actually have to share anything and that it that we don't have to ensure specifically and concretely that space resources um, are um, used for everyone um but i guess you know we can argue about that you know no no or no legal article can be just taken as symbolic while others are taken you know as um as clear um so that's one area that is that is unclear another area is the article two of the outer space treaty about non-appropriation the non-appropriation principle that says no one can actually own a celestial body no one can own the moon mars an asteroid um and um and um, extract their sovereignty and their their legal regimes and their norms and rules there um, um this um has been in many ways rejected as non in um a conflict with the use of resources um mainly because for example in the area of use of resources from the um, deep seabeds um uh, the non-appropriation principle is also applied um but using the resources doesn't mean someone is you know claiming sovereignty on, over that area if it's being you know um accepted and and agreed on by the international community um and if it's being done in a way that doesn't you know let's say destroy the area um similarly we can uh think about the using of the earth's orbits earth's orbits are very valuable um there's a big competition about securing those orbits um uh, around the around the uh, um uh, the planet earth um but uh, it is not considered that if someone's using it that they're um, um, that they are um, you know claiming sovereignty over them. Um, it, it's it's a bit much more complicated when it comes to uh, space resources because you know if you use the space resource you cannot return it there. If you let's say use a smaller space resource of a smaller asteroid and mine part of it, you will change the complete um, physiology of that object and it will likely disintegrate or change its orbits um and then it also comes to issue of um of those polar regions where there's water if you use that water which is essentially limited um uh, there will not be any more left well, i mean how do we decide what do we do with all that propellant uh potential propellant we have on the moon do we use it to expand beyond the moon and for scientific reasons do we use it to fuel satellites on our orbit to provide commercial um communication or do we fuel earth observation satellites to help us fight climate change these are questions you know that you know we 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 um, um should be asking um and um and uh we don't have answers to so <clears throat> these are the two main um legal legal questions here um for use of resources in space um uh, other issue that is that is uh, plaguing you know the development of this area is the knowledge gap um it's a bit more technical question um i tried to play this short, short video just to demonstrate uh, how complicated it is this this is a um this is a probe that has landed on an asteroid um and tried to collect just a bit of samples and because of the microgravity um microgravity um environment just by them just gently touching the area they just change the whole dynamic of of, of the body pieces start flying um, um and um you know imagine mining <laughs> on that area um, uh, the picture above that, I think, is a picture of um, of asteroid Ragu. Um, it's it's sort of a moldy surface, um, just landing there, operating there, flying there. It's just extremely uh, difficult that we don't have the technology to do that yet. Uh, moreover, we don't know exactly how much water is in the polar regions. We know there is water, but we know it because um, um, uh, because there were impacts made on those regions by another satellite. So the way we found out that there is water is that one satellite crashed into those regions. Another satellite was measuring how what ejecta, like was what plumes of dust were ejected into the air, and then measured those those ejecta and measured the content in, of water in those ejecta. Um, and the estimates range from three percent to twenty five percent. So that's not safe. That's not uh, you know well described enough for us to. Um, to go there so and and why this is important um we don't know what exactly is there what quantity what quality and how exactly we'll get it so that limits us from understanding how do we actually share the benefits what does it can we can can um, these resources be appropriated 
um, how do we, uh, what do we do even with these resources? <clears throat> And um, another gap is obviously, um, as I mentioned, the governance gap. Um, the, um, the discussions at the, at the UN COPUS, um, the Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space, um, has started several years ago. At first, um, the countries couldn't even agree on starting to discuss this topic. A few years later, when several countries have advanced in the development of their space resources technology and have their own laws, um, um, and, and some, you know, um, extra ad hoc working groups were established. Um, uh, this spring, uh, the COPUS committee actually agreed on creating non-binding, just free group, working group to discuss these things. Um, uh, but there's obviously no real progress in this area. Um, uh, and the discussion sort of ranges between suggesting that if you mine resources, you will be you you have to comply with the benefit sharing principle just by providing scientific data to other people, or just by you know telling them about you know how successful you are on your um, space resources utilization mission, um, uh, which obviously opens a lot of criticism of how useful is it for a developing country to know how much you can mine in space. How, who is it actually benefiting and is this a real benefit sharing um, and other you know area is you know discussions about some sort of a global taxation um, in exchange for authorizing uh, space resources uh, missions or creating something as an international authority like the international seabed authority that decides that you can mine something somewhere in exchange for some sort of fee um, here, it, no, it, it fits to note that the International Seabed Authority, since its, found, uh, since its um, um, establishment in the, um, I think, 90s, um, has not advanced into discussions what, how much countries that want to mine on the seabed actually have to pay and what should they pay and, and who decides about this. So that just illustrates um, um, uh, the governance gap. and, and uh, one of the issues here, obviously, is the growing geopolitical competition in space between um, mainly the U.S. and China um, that is, you know, um, making it unlikely for some sort of a grand agreement to be established. And, and it's already happening that space resources are sort of becoming a topic of geopolitical tension. We now have sort of a two parallel um, geopolitical, um, um, let's say, blocks um, that um, in, in the area of moon um, space resource utilization and moon, let's say, uh, colonization on the side of the US is the Artemis Accords um, by the United States, um, uh, which is essentially an intergovernmental agreement, which establishes rules for and a and, and lot of good safety procedures for actors that want to set up, um, um, set up um, uh, activities on the moon. Um, uh, but one of the controversial issues here is that, firstly, it's intergovernmental. It um, it um, it is it is not open. Um, it copies the geopolitical partnerships of the United States, um, and um, it includes the establishment of safety zones, essentially um, claiming not sovereignty but control over an area with potential resources, um, and you know blocking anyone who might you know be close to that. And how does that fit into ensuring that space, you know, is is a province of um, humankind that it benefits everyone and that it can be accessed by anyone? Um, how that plugs into that is is obviously questionable. On the other hand, we have the um, the Chinese um, uh, plans for the International Research Lunar Station. Um, um, they have signed an agreement with Russia on uh, developing this, and. Um, while the United States have adopted their own national law for space resources, saying you can mine in space and, and pursue this bilateral intergovernmental agreement path, um, China goes a different way. China goes the way through the United Nations. Um, they use the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs as sort of a point of contact and, and a body to promote their plans for Chinese space station and, and moon station, saying this is being done for um, the benefit of mankind and anyone can come in and join us and uh, we will do this together. Um, so they're just pursuing a completely different path, the path through the UN. Um, although the interests are the same, um, 
one is trying to gain legitimacy for their space, space resources uh, activities through the UN. The other one is doing it through geopolitics and through bilateral agreements. Um, so, and, and, and this is just sort of an uh, introduction that I wanted to make, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief on the ways we, um, uh, we have thought about um, uh, finding some sort of a fix to this um, knowledge gap, to this legal gap and governance gap. And that comes from the social license to operate as a concept that is being used by um, private mining actors um, on, on earth to ensure that you know, they protect their investments, their operations in the areas where there is a legal gap, there is a governance gap, where a state cannot ensure that you know, their mining operations will be protected. Um, so they have to go out themselves and ensure that the community, communities where they have a mining operations are okay with um, them, you know, mining there. Um, and um, it is a concept that is being widely used It's well described as a process that serves interests of the both sides. Some view it as a concept that is uh, much more um, uh, keen to the interests of the, you know, um, uh, the big corporate uh, mining companies. Some see it as a way for the local communities to ensure really that there are some benefits um, coming from the mining operations. Um, but I think one of the main interesting things to me here is that it is described as an ongoing process and relationship of you know, the mining company gaining legitimacy and trust and credibility from um, the local communities. Uh, it doesn't have to be local. It can be you know, um, uh, international. It, can be, it doesn't have to copy any geographical lines, but I think the main principle associated with the community that can grant a social license to operate is the fact that they can disrupt the operation. They can, um, they can in some ways, um, threaten the investments and um, step into this process. Um, uh, so we looked at this as, a, as sort of an inspiration for how to fix the legal and, and governance gap for space resources, um, um, thinking that, you know, if, any national space legislation now is not clear about what does benefit sharing actually mean and how you can fulfill it. Having a clear legal framework that says this is how you have to fulfill it can be viewed as an you know, investment opportunity in a sense that it would provide much more stable legal uh, protection of those investments because it cannot be challenged by the, uh, by the uh, international community for violating the benefit sharing principle. Um, and here, the um, international community that is that is considered as the one affected by by these operations, because they're also the only ones that can cause some disruption, whether legally or also due to just the pure physics on the moon. If you're mining somewhere on the moon and someone lands several hundred kilometers next to you, that just disrupts the microgravity environment so much. It can uh, throw a lot of pieces, a lot of debris into the air that can damage the operations. If you remember the, um, the picture I showed at the beginning um, of the mining operation that uh, depends on the mirrors that direct the sunlight to the mining operations. If you get a bit of uh, dust on those, um, on those mirrors, your mining operation would be disrupted. So these are ways that without clear, clear rules and safety protocols and standards, um, um, uh, space resource uh, operation could be easily disrupted. Um, and another um, uh, motivation here is that, um, uh, that you know, in the space resource area, uh, despite its mentioned potential about, you know, hundreds of billions of euros that you can, you can capture there, um, uh, there has not been that big of an investment appetite to invest there. Um, um, and I think part of it is obviously the knowledge gap, but part of it is clearly the unclear legal environment, the lack of clarity and stability um, that, you know, the investments of the people um, uh, will be protected because no one can really protect it because no one has figured out how to ensure that the benefit sharing is there. Um, because everyone will say, if you tax the space resources companies or uh, require them to share uh, some of, you know, benefits, they will never invest in this because these will be investments for decades. Um, uh, so these are the, you know, arguments that have stopped people from really considering how actually, why don't we view the benefit sharing principle not as a, um, not as an 
um, a painful obligation that will harm us, but as an opportunity to really gain legitimacy for space operations, because there's not a lot of legitimacy in many space activities. If you think about the billionaires joyriding to space and um, and wasting uh, billions of dollars and, and and billions of tons of carbon dioxide by those rides, um, I think there's a, a lot of value to that. Um, and the solution we had is the sort of a investor oriented benefit sharing um, approach, where on one side you have national governments that say clearly um, what a company that wants to mine in space has to comply with and says these are areas that you have to contribute to, um, and we have a lot of global um, uh, globally defined, you know, goals from the SDGs to Paris Agreement to long-term sustainability guidelines for outer space. And but clearly, the Paris Agreement can be, you know, a good starter and define, um, you know, what what are the areas that um, a space mining company has to contribute to um, uh, if they want to gain the space mining authorization. Um, that's on one side, but on the other side, leave a big room up to the investors to define specifically how they will contribute to the area. Because if you have a concrete tax rate, if you have, if, if you want uh, the benefit sharing to be done through um, uh, cash transfers, um, that's probably the most ineffective way to share benefits. If you have a company that is mining water or propellant on the moon, having them having to tax them internationally and having some sort of a global tax and global redistribution scheme I, I i think that is that would be very ineffective and the actual benefits that would float to all the countries would be hard to measure not mentioning that you know the interests and demands of all the countries shift constantly and it's it's um um it it doesn't seem as as a way to go but if you have these companies define what may be in practice or in form of an in-kind contribution they can share, um, it can be much more effective. For example, if there is a space mining company um, uh, that is likely operating some, um, some satellites um, and they're generating propellant, they can provide propellant for free for Earth observation satellites that will um, uh, help us observe Earth, observe environment. Um, example of this principle is, for example, a Luxembourg company, a satellite company, SES, which has a um, which is a program together with the Luxembourg government that in case of crisis um, or disaster, natural disaster somewhere in the world, they will for free provide those satellite cap capacities, ground um, uh, communication stations immediately to those areas um, impacted by disaster. So provide free disaster relief. Um, if a company can say, we will provide this capacity for, you know, globally um, in exchange for us doing some resource utilization um, and provide it as an argument and, and provide that they're credible and, and build, you know, a, a track record of, you know, communicating with the, let's say, developing countries or any, any country across the world and understanding what they actually need and how this couldn't work. This could be a much more effective way how to, um, how to comply with the benefit sharing principles. So coming back to the uh, social license to operate principle, it would be um, based on the investors building a relationship with the community members, meaning the global community, understanding their needs and, 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 and their requirements and coming up with the solution themselves. The state would be the one that would have to sanction it and maybe test the, uh, uh, the validity of it because they will be the ultimately the ones legally liable for the activities of, of the state. Um, um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's an approach that would, um, that would uh, sidetrack the lack of knowledge because we cannot say how to share the benefits and how to tax them because we actually do not know exactly at what the benefits will be. Um, it would allow to be flexible in a way um, in, in delivering the needs that nation states actually have. Um, and it would uh, shift the responsibility much more to the investor uh, and have them to figure it out um, if they really want to mine. If they want to mine, they can figure out and propose a way how they will comply with the benefit sharing principle themselves.